Hi, I'm Michael Foley. I'm owner of um, Green Uprising Farm out on East Hill Road. But I'm up here to welcome you to the Grange. Uh, a lot of you folks know that the Grange has been going through changes. We've got a new commercial kitchen over here, uh, various renovation projects in our minds and in the works. Um, uh, but also the Grange has sort of formed its, its mission around supporting local, a local food economy and local agriculture. Um, and so we're very pleased to host this event, very pleased that Doug has put, the, put this event together. And thank you for turning out, and uh, thanks to Doug for putting this on. And uh, I'm looking forward to a, to a great discussion. Thank you, Michael. Uh, well, I'm Doug Mosel, um, hay farmer and uh, uh, grain farmer. I live in Anderson Valley. And uh, I'm part of the Mendocino Organic Network and the Redwood Empire Farmers Union. Um, the Mendocino Organic Network is, uh, uh, was formed in 2001, and uh, you would probably know us best because it was our group that initiated the uh, Measure Age campaign in 2003, 2004, um, that made Mendocino County the first uh, county to ban genetically engineered crops. Um, and no matter how you stood on that issue, um, that's probably why you know Mendocino Organic Network. Um, and we uh, are, are sponsors of the Renegade Certification Program. It's a, it's a peer uh, certification program for farmers, gardeners, and ranchers in the county. Uh, we have about 20 certified farms and gardens at this point um, around the county, uh, including one right here in Willits. Um, and uh, that's, that's, a, that's a local inexpensive alternative to the rather expensive and involved um, National Organic Certification Program. The Redwood Empire Farmers Union is a, 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 an affiliate of the California Farmers Union and the National Farmers Union. The National Farmers Union um, was formed in 19, uh, 1903 uh, as an advocate for family farmers when uh, already then family farms were under threat. Um, so we're a new chapter, a fledgling small chapter um, uh, in the county. Actually, it's Mendocino and Lake and Humboldt and uh, Sonoma counties. We decided, um, and we've already heard Michael make reference to the local food economy. Uh, it's on the minds of probably almost everybody in this room, I suspect. Um, we decided that we um, wanted to be sure, when I say we, I'm talking about the Mendocino Organic Network. We, we want to see the local food economy be um, on the agenda of the leaders of the county. And we thought one way that we could help make that happen uh, would be to sponsor these food and farming forums uh, in both districts where supervisors will be elected um, this year. <clears throat> so we've done two of them in the 5th District already, uh, one in Anderson Valley, one uh, in Manchester, uh, both of those also in cooperation with the Grange. Uh, and so we're happy that number three happens in District 3, uh, and again with the sponsorship of the Grange. So we're, we're really grateful to the Grangers for supporting this. Um, we do not take a, st we, do, we will not endorse a candidate. Uh, and our, 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 first of all, we are, we're a nonprofit, so we can't politically do that. Um, but we don't want to really because we think it's more important that we bring the voices of the candidates to the people who will make the decision. So we want this to be a really open process and we want you to hear where your three candidates stand um, on questions related to the local food economy. I'm going to pose some questions that were developed by members of the Mendocino Organic Network and by the, the local Grange here. Um, and following that, that'll probably take us, I'm going to say 45 minutes or so. And following that, we'll have opportunity for audience questions. The format will be as follows. I'm going to pose some questions to the three of you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll announce you formally here in a minute. I'm going to pose questions um, in order, and we'll, we'll change that order for each question. Um, I'll ask you to keep to two, two and a half minutes 
in your responses. Um, as time permits, if you want to have a little interaction on a question, that'll be permitted, of course. Um, and uh, we'll just try to keep it moving as efficiently as we can uh, so that there's plenty of time for audience questions, which we hope there will be. I think that's all we need to say. So um, I want to say thanks to John Pinches and Holly Madrigal and Tony Orth for being here. This is great. We, the, all the candidates showed up in the 5th District and they took this seriously, I'm happy to say. And we're grateful that you're doing the same. So John, if you'll be first, um, I'll ask you the first question. Um, what priority relative to the other problems facing Mendocino County would you place on local food production? Well, certainly I, I have to put that as a high priority as many of you probably do not know. My, my family has been local food production. My great, my grandfather actually uh, back, this is before, actually before the uh, 20s and into the 20s uh, supplied, had a slaughterhouse in Laytonville and supplied the valleys of uh, Willits and Laytonville valleys with, with uh, pork, pork and, and beef and lambs and supplied the butcher shops here in Willits and in Laytonville. Uh, what really put that out of business, a small local <coughs> ability to do that, was the, uh, the meat industry was one of the first uh, areas that the United States government felt it had to be regulated. And uh, regulation of the meat industry uh, basically knocked the, the little guys out of business and then you had to build multi-million dollar facilities. But uh, my family's been involved in that. Uh, my ranch is, uh, although it's not certified, it certainly could be organic. Uh, I mean, our family's been producing uh, beef and lambs long before the word organic ever even was heard of, but uh, it's certainly, uh, you know, the ranch is way out in the, the hills. It's about three hours on the Manual River from here. But to my interest in uh, sustainability and agriculture in, in, uh, is certainly nothing. It's what I was raised with all my life, so it has to, I think it's really important. And I really see Mendocino County totally underutilized as far as the, uh, the grazing land and, and, the, and the things that, just in my lifetime, the things that I used to see in these valleys that happened, uh, it's, it's really, the decrease has really been, it's been, been really dramatic and it's not something I'm pleased about, but uh, there's a lot of factors involved, land, uh, land use, uh, water availability, uh, regulation is a big part, uh, but when I was a kid, there was a lot of dairies and then, for instance, in this valley, a lot of grain being produced out on the, on the east side out there. And uh, the, the production capabilities of these valleys is tremendous compared to what we're doing with them right now. Thank you. Holly? Well, if there's any of you who don't know me, I'm Holly Madrigal. Uh, we didn't have a chance to introduce ourselves, but just in case you don't know. And I'm running for office in the third district because I think I have the fresh leadership and the experience to back it up. And one of the primary areas in which I think that my focus has always been is in the local food movement. And that's for a number of reasons. At, at the county level, I do think that also one of my priorities is finances at the county. But as far as food production, the reason why I've, I want to say I've been involved even before this supervisorial race. And the primary reason is because we really don't grow, we grow very little of our food in the area. And by increase, increasing our food production to getting more towards how it used to be here, here in the third district in general, by returning to those roots, we protect ourselves and we strengthen our community. And there's a number of reasons why creating in increasing food production in our areas is very important. And I think that it will continue to be a high priority for me uh, when I serve as supervisor. But it's always, it's a continual process. And I think growing our community from all, all areas, uh, from farmers and ranchers, but they also need to be supported at the governmental level, and at the community level. We really need to put our, our dollars where our hearts are and I think that that's one of the ways that we can excel as a community is by strengthening the farms in that way. I just went to an economic development, uh, local food as economic development meeting. And I think it was something like, yes, uh, let's see, 233 million in food dollars each year that are leaving this area. That's what we spend on our food anyway. 
and it's, it's exiting. So we not only strengthen our economy by keeping those dollars locally, if we just shift maybe even just 15% of our, our spending, because we, we all eat three times a day or more, depending on who we are. <laughs> and if we just shifted three, you know, 15% of that, it would have a huge financial, real economic impact in our community and in our county, in the third district, which really could use those dollars. So it's definitely a high, high priority for me. And, and I was very excited to have this forum here tonight because, I've, as I've mentioned to a few of you, currently there's no other Willits Candidates Night that's going to be planned. The Willits News is not going to be having one or AAUW. They usually do those events. So I appreciate that this event is focused around food and farming and agriculture, uh, but I certainly welcome questions on all issues. Thank you. Thank you. Tony. I'm uh, Tony Orth. I uh, live up in Brook Trails where I built my passive solar home and uh, started life uh, out of high school. Instead of going to college, I went right into organic uh, food production in my town and helped organize a green belt movement around the city of Boston. Uh, organic certification was non-existent at that time, so that was part of our movement was to actually establish the origination of certification programs for organic production. And those two years were kind of interesting because I, not going to college, I was available for the draft. So it was some kind of sacrifice where you made yourself available to your township to develop organic farming. And in Western Mass, we started what was called the Green Power Farm. And in my own property, I, uh, with a brother and a friend, we started the Western Ecology Action Center. And that was uh, due to Earth Day. Earth Day got me started. The original Earth Day just kind of woke us all up. Uh, we were young, we were ready to go and change the world, really. And we wanted to change it for the better and bring uh, back uh, endangered species and, and bring back food production on a local area where it was being suburbanized. In my hometown, of course, uh, subdivisions were occurring. And fortunately, we convinced our township to do a bond issue and buy uh, 2,000 acres of open space lands. We got 20 acres right into food production. We tied it through our recreation, our town's recreation department to our schools. We started ecology uh, education programs with our students. Uh, we have summer camp out on the farm. It's been going for 40 years. It's an example for the nation. It's a well-known, if you do green power farm in your internet, you'll pull up the whole program. Harvard University had their uh, about 200 acres and special species plantings that they ended up donating into the program uh, about 15 years into it. So uh, the township now has a, a market that they anyone in town can go to and buy uh, freshly produced organic food uh, and flowers, cut flowers uh, all year round. And so uh, it's a major program. A lot of our kids now from our schools go to ag schools at the college level and actually have helped produce uh, quite a bit of uh, advance for the organic movement. I was proud to be part of that. Great. Thank you all. Um, I'll remind you we're aiming for about two and a half minutes max on Is your there responses, a way you can please. Signal us in do you some want me way? to um, ding you a little? Yes. I can do that. Great. All right. Um, I don't want to be too pushy. I've been known to be a little bit of a tight timekeeper, so I don't want to be too pushy, but I did, I'll remind you. Okay, so Holly, you'll be next. Okay. What specifically could we expect of you as supervisor in terms of leadership and advocacy for growing a strong local food economy? Specifically, I think what I have going for me and what I would represent at the county is my already existing involvement in a, in a lot of organizations. I'm uh, actually just Join, I'm just becoming a formal member of the Grange uh, this next month, uh, but I've been involved from way back in the, uh, the grant process to get uh, it for, and helping form the kitchen here in the Grange that was really sought as a way for uh, local farmers to have more ability to turn their crops into value-added products. Um, as well as just today, as Doug knows, we received the silos that are being put in here. Uh, we have some small silos that are going to be able to hold bean and beans and grains. 
so that Mason no longer has to truck them in here every farmer's market. Uh, I also, part of my platform is my accessibility and I have chosen to pioneer that by having an office here at the farmer's market and I think that at the supervisorial level that will be even more important because being in the heart of where people are actually trying to support themselves by selling food and products here in our community, that really is the community hub and if I'm there it is really helpful and resourceful to hear firsthand what people are needing. I think that there's going to be a lot coming up in the coming years at the county level on water policy, which as we know water policy and uh, any food production goes hand in hand. So I think that specifically that's going to be an issue where my voice will be important as well as zoning issues. Uh, we, uh, I'm part of a group that is working on an open space and recreation district and agriculture is a key component of that as well. And the, Great. the county Thank is currently you. supportive. But, yeah. Tony. Over uh, the last couple of years, I've been advocating for Brook Trails to uh, identify some community garden sites. Uh, because we were in a water moratorium, uh, I made sure that during that process of describing our new water rights, that we're reserving raw water supplies, because Holly's right. Water is so critical to ag. You need not only the land, you need the water supply. And you don't want chlorinated water to go onto your crops. It's, it's just not good for it. So we have now designated up in Brook Trails. One is really nice. It's the old horse corral that uh, is up by Willits Creek, uh, by Old Grove, uh, very central into the district. Uh, we have raw water there available, so it's a good, deep soil source. And then over by the dam site, uh, Lake Emily, uh, it's at the end of the golf course. We have an additional site that we've identified where we have both raw water and the land mass. So what you've got to do to increase food production in the area, of course, is look in your own community, make it available. Now we just need the gardeners. We need to get the fencing up. We need to begin to uh, develop it. And I've spoken to the groups that do that uh, to come up and speak to our general manager, and, and that will get going. This area has been great in the sense of really taking off through uh, well and gulp and all the localization efforts. So I'm going to be supporting those efforts uh, big time in the future because it's the right way to go. It's uh, community building and coalition building is what I'm used to doing. So as supervisor, I'll continue that process and make sure that we have interregional um, sharing of both uh, technology in the sense of new uh, ways to produce our, and, and then I've also fought for the cold storage building at the old pear sheds because I see a need to have that uh, facility for our regional needs for all our localization groups to have cold storage available for their crops so that they can market them over a longer period of time and we shouldn't lose that as a uh, community resource. Thank you. John. Well, first of all, I'd like to start before we move forward on this issue of what I've done in the, since my term here almost the last four years. As you may or may not know, the general plan when I went into office was about seven years late from being done. Uh, I pushed forward and we put timetables on it. Now we do have a general plan for the next 10 years that's been adopted as far as it affects the third district. It protects all the agricultural land. I think there was only about five land use changes on five different pieces of property in the whole third district. So we preserved the, the, the agricultural land use space for the future. Also our Williamson Act, we had a lot of people in the Williamson Act that were not complying. They were just getting the tax benefit and not, and not living up to the contract to keep that, ag, uh, that Williamson Act land in production. We're presently, uh, we've done the first two phases of that review. We've thrown some owners out of the Williamson Act because they just weren't living up to the contract. So it will make people want to, if they have Williamson Act land and get the tax break, they're going to have to be keeping the land in production. Uh, also, I'm pushing for, uh, uh, through the um, on our resource committee, to I got a couple of uh, uh, foresters looking into the idea of going back and look at the idea of small landowners that have minimal amounts of timber that they may, may want to harvest through the years to help them supplement their agriculture income on their land to make the rules to where you don't have to buy, spend $50,000 on a harvest plan to sell $5,000 worth of timber. So I'm, I'm working on that. Also, you know, Tony said, you know, without ag land, as far as type A ag land, if you don't have good water, you don't have much. <laughs> Uh, I was criticized right here in this room four years ago for my position on the Eel River, 
but uh, th through my efforts, I really feel that the Eel River water in the Eel River is better protected for the future of pen people of Mendocino County. Because if you know what's happening over in the Delta, all the way to the Delta in the, in the Central Valley, there's a real look all over for water. And where they're going to look, they're going to look to the Eel River because it's the most major source of water that's untapped. And I believe that we've positioned our county to where we have, we may not be able to stop it when they come after it because of the millions of people that, that want it. But we're, we position ourselves, we're in a position of kind of like a, we have the first right of refusal. And so I think we're, we're a whole lot better positioned to protect our water resources, which is valuable not only for people use, but for certainly for agriculture. So those are some of the things that, that I've been able to do in, in the past. Uh, the Williamson Act, uh, I feel really proud to be able to keep, even with a tight budget, we are in place. We have the Williamson Act. We don't have this funding, the subvention funding. In other words, that's the backfill of money that the state always gives the counties to pay that. But we, it costs us about $550,000, but we, we sucked it up and we still have a, a Williamson Act in Mendocino County. Thank you. Um, aside from this very grange in which we sit tonight, uh, there are virtually no commercial kitchens in the third district uh, for processing local food at affordable rates. What can the county do to encourage local food processing given state and federal regulations that present almost impossible hurdles for small scale producers? Well, there's the Economic Development Financing Corporation, but in the communities as you travel, they all want to have the same kitchen that we have here at this Grange. There isn't a community in Mendocino County I've run across that doesn't want to have access to a good quality commercial kitchen. And that is, uh, to your last question, uh, one of those answers. How do you build a local food, food economy? Well, you have those added value products that you can produce through a commercial kitchen. And so I think uh, this is a model. Willits has been very good at being a model. And I think that's what we should continue. Uh, I'm interested to see what the next project's going to be. But I think we're going to see more commercial kitchens. And I think uh, the success of this one's going to help that happen uh, throughout the county. Because the interest is definitely there everywhere you go. Uh, every Grange could put in one of these. It's a good model. Uh, I love the way the Granges are coming back to life. It, it's, it's just going to be a real opportunity for the next generation to show what they can do. Uh, Holly says, new leadership, well, uh, I want to see it. Let's see our youth getting involved like we did and, and bring it about. I think us older folk can help it. Thank you. John? Uh, well, in the last 10 years, uh, there's been a strong interest in Covalo and Laytonville to put in uh, uh, kitchens that can be used for different community members to come in and make their, product, their jams or their jellies or whatever. Uh, I think it's really unique here to the Grange here in Willits because this is an organization that over time the Grange has, has held together. You've got young members, you've got old members, and you need that organization. And frankly, in Laytonville and Covalo, they just didn't have that to the level. What happens, the person may be interested in really pushing it forward because they have more product that they want to make. And then after a year or two, that it fall apart. But Somehow the glues kind of held this Grange together and they've really went forward with it. But it's a, it's a considerable investment and you have to have a facility. And it's, uh, I just feel really proud that, that in the third district there's at least this one here at the Grange. But it takes a lot of, uh, as, as you, many of you folks know has been involved in this Grange, it takes a lot of uh, effort, a lot of uh, volunteer time and whatnot to hold it together. It's not something you can just, and to stay, sustain it over time, that's probably the big thing. You know, and then the reality of it is when you, let's say you make whatever product you're making, whether you're canning pears or apples or anything, ultimately to do it on a larger scale, you know, you ultimately compete with, well, what can they go to Safeway and buy that same can of pears or something for? So that's on always, that's an always, you know, when they mass produce a product, that's always you're competing. At some point in time, you do compete with that. You'd like to think that, and your product is far, far superior, but at some point in time, you have to compete with that and keep it on a, a level playing field. But uh, what you folks have done here is really unique and it's really impressive. And it'd be nice, I'd like to tell people that we could get more of these kitchens all over the county, but uh, the reality of that, it's just, I think what's more important, let's try to uh, fully utilize like the ones we have, like here at the Grange. Holly? Uh, right on that, 
right on that. Uh, on following on, on those coat heels, I'm a big supporter of using what we already have. We actually do have commercial kitchens all over the place in the sense that we have large scale kitchens already in our schools, uh, in other granges, as was mentioned, uh, it, at the city hall. And really, it's the permitting. I'm a big, I'm a big supporter of using what we already have and making it, making it work. So it really does get hung up on the permitting issue. And so I think if we can figure out a way to access what is existing, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and build all these new kitchens all over the place because they exist. We just have to be able to get through the regulatory hurdles to make that happen. And I really think that sort of doing a dual thing of creating markets f for these products, if we don't have people who want to know that they can sell the produce that they're growing in their backyard and pickle it and, and can it and sell it. And I do think that uh, John's right. I don't think we should go for, I don't think we should try to compete with big. We have small and small scale is really what we're good at. And I think that's how we're going to strengthen our communities is if we can engage people who aren't already being engaged. Uh, the Hispanic community, I know many people that make incredible food that they can do on a on a reasonable scale to share with the community, but currently they're not being shown that there's outlets for marketing those goods. Um, another thing I'm interested in is possibly flea markets. Flea markets have some different regulations than farmers markets, and I wonder if there's a way, uh, farmers markets really are supporting farmers, and you can have a certain amount of other vendors in there, but I think flea markets have a different sort of regulation, regulatory structure, and so if we could we need you know, some more taco trucks, and I'd, I'd love to be able to get some tamales. And I know a lot of people who would love to supplement their income, but are intimidated by the regulatory process. So I think whatever we can do to engage other members in our community and let them know that there's a market out there. Tony. Same question, oh, uh, Richard. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that the end? That was the. Because oh, I, I oh. would love to say that I, I know Cobalo. <laughs> Cobalo <laughs> is ready to go. I did, didn't I? They've got ready it on their plans for the library yeah. community center. Yeah. You know, localized <laughs> means don't travel so far. <laughs> All right, sorry about this. This happens to me regularly. People have to keep me straight. Um, well, so John, we're back to you. Uh, uh, and this kind of follows on the heels of one question about uh, where regulation came up uh, in terms of hurdles. Um, my understanding uh, is that uh, environmental health um, ha is, has recently uh, threatened to require farmers market vendors to store their meat in uh, a certified facility uh, that is a commercial kitchen or a storage facility. Um, how would you address that threat? Uh, as uh, as supervisor, assuming you're reelected. <coughs> well, it, yes, you're right as far as in the county environmental health, but you got to realize the county environmental health only enforces state regulations, and when it comes to to the storage of any any uh, uh, processed food that has the ability to spoil, it's got to be uh, uh, either you know under 40 degrees, so mm -hmm. it, and it has to be uh, meat by law has to be stored in a in, inspected facility. You can't take like ranch kill beef and put it in a facility that's alongside a federally inspected meat. That's a uh, that's a federal regulation that is that's passed down to the states. It's actually enforced by the local county uh, environmental health division. And that's just you know, uh, <coughs> Keith's Market over in Covalo that just built a wonderful brand new store that makes any Safeway store look look second rate. If any of you have been over there lately. He's put a, in a, a brand new, huge uh, smoking facility for hams and bacons of, of the ranch kill and hogs and all that. It's really remarkable what he's done. And it's cost a lot of money, but he's done everything by the law and all the regulations. So it's a little bit out of the way. But Covalo does have a state-of-the-art facility for doing that. It does make, when you're talking about meat, though, bringing it to farmer's market and, and stuff, uh, they've been a little bit, probably in the past, uh, a little bit lax on the enforcement of it, but but that's the law. That's not a county law. That's a federal law that's passed down that it has to be, you know, stored under certain temperatures. Mm -hmm. I'd, li I'd like to say I could 
continue to see the farmers market a little slight about that, but you kind of realize if there was, if somebody got sick or something and got a foodborne illness, it'd be some, it'd be probably end up shutting you down and, or worse. So I think that law is, is put in place. It's for everybody's safety. Mm -hmm. Holly. Well, it is sort of unfortunate that as time has gone on, I've seen regulation become so much more of a hurdle unless I know it, it comes from a place of wanting to, you know, curtail foodborne illness. And I understand that it comes from a good place, but in my experience, it's just gotten out of control uh, to the extent that you're not supposed to drink or share the milk from the cow that you milk in your own backyard. That, I mean, and so what's, what that is creating is a need to be creative and figure out other ways to do it. And, and that's what people are doing. For example, farm fresh milk. You know, you can, communities are coming up with ways around it, but it's really unfortunate that regulation is, is a barrier rather than a facilitating process to help keep us safe. I mean, the things that the government doesn't get involved with that are far more dangerous than drinking the milk from your neighbor's cow and supporting them, uh, it baffles me where the focus is shifted and where the, those dollars are spent. And I think that it's true that it is a state regulation, but we as a community need to be up in arms if they require, for example, animal identification, which was you know uh, being talked about. Uh, things that are totally feasible if you have a giant massive feedlot, but completely uh, detrimental to small farmers and ranchers. And I completely support making your voice heard, whether it's in the Farm Bureau, whether it's in uh, well economic localization. I'm, I'm on that board as well. <laughs> I'm on well as well. But what, you know, whatever form it is that you choose to get your voice heard, I think it's important to comment on those regulations and not just let them go by. And we really set the bar on that with, with Measure H, and that's a perfect example of what we can do locally to make a difference nationally. Okay, thank you. Tony? I would say mobilize, regionalize, and set up your cooperative. You have all the farmer markets in the county. You, you set your time for when you have your markets. You have a truck that's a refrigerator truck that can go and be cost-shared amongst the farmer markets. You get a grant from that regulatory agency to buy that truck and you operate it cooperatively. Those are the kind of answers when government puts a regulation down you require and you go to your legislators and you get them to spend the money to make it work because it is a public health issue. They're supposed to be protecting us but they need to put the assets forward so that we can operate under those regulations in a reasonable fashion. That's why you do things cooperatively and, and with co-ops. Um, there's a lot of things we can mobilize things that we used to think we had to fix in one place and you bring the feedstock to, it's just the opposite. We have to be mobile. We have to share assets and then cost share. And we can do that because if the regulatory agency is going to require it, then we can go to our legislators and say, give us the money, we'll buy the truck, we'll meet your regulation. And, and that's what we got to do. And that's the kind of work I've been doing for 30 years, most of my life. There is, I'd like to add to this, there is one way that you can get around a lot of this, what I call it's low-level regulation that's very restrictive like the farmers markets. Really what, what to start the, the, where you get the problem with violating the law is when you have the point of sale. And if you went to a barter system and didn't have that point of sale, as an example, if I took a steer off of my ranch and, and slaughtered it, I can sell half of it. But if I sell the whole, slaughter, sell the whole steer, then I get in the whole regulatory process and get in big trouble. But if I, I could give or I could trade 10 steers for like for so many tons of hay or something, I can do that and totally avoid the regulatory process. Same with the timber industry. You can go out here on your 40 acres and you can cut some trees and saw them into lumber and trade them to your neighbor for a hog or something and there's no, you're not breaking the law. But if you cut that tree down and sell that lumber, sell it, then you need the forty, fifty thousand dollar harvest plan. So there are at the at the lower end, like farmers markets and localization, does have the ability. I'm not so sure we would have, unless all the farmers organizations all over California or all the United States really got together and really had a big voice. But keep in mind, people in agriculture are only about three three percent of the people anyway. So you don't really have a strong democratic voice. 
But if at the local level, you could be, by doing the barter process, you can get around a lot of that process. Now, of course, if you go into the big scale of doing things, you're going to have to have bigger bills to pay, and that takes cash, so you've got to sell something. But on the lower end, if you stay through the barter system, you can kind of go on the radar screen and operate. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, John had an additional comment here, so uh, Holly or Tony, either of you want to add anything? Okay. All right. Not yet. You'll get to ask. Sit tight. We we'll have three more questions I want to pose to him. All right. Let's continue to keep it brief. So um, if I have my order correct, Holly, you'll be mm -hmm. next. Um, would you support a mobile or stationary slaughter facility and meat processing facility in the third district or another appropriate location in the county? Yes, I would. Uh, I sit on EDFC, which uh, was the group that helped fund the study uh, along with the uh, University of California at the feasibility of having a meat processing facility in originally it was being thought of as in Ukiah. I really don't think Ukiah is the best place for it. I, I really like the idea of north of Willits at that old mill site. But there are a number of hurdles and when I bring up meat processing you would not believe some of the, the comments I get in the community. I heard, I heard a constituent say that they did not want our valley turned into a vortex of death, <laughs> which I appreciate. And I promptly asked him if he was a vegetarian, because I don't think he is. And so I really think that we need to stop being so reactionary. Uh, if someone has an idea, let's talk about it. If I think, like everything in our area, it completely depends on scale. No one in the third district wants a feedlot type of situation. Uh, I was recently in Covalo because there's a, a meat producers guild that's forming in Covalo, has formed in Covalo, and they are very interested in this as well. And so they're interested in whether or not they could have a facility out there and have it be involved with the tribe, have the tribe have an income besides uh, casinos or you know, an alternative income, and they're really interested in the localization movement out there. And they had a really creative idea, I thought, which was, because one of the main hurdles is the inspector, the USDA inspector that has to be on site. That's one of the issues with the, with the mobile unit. The mobile facility gets caught up in red tape because of the inspector. And so a gentleman, uh, Jesse Burnett, who's a, the tribal representative, said, how about you know, we have telemedicine. Why can't we have tele-inspecting? <laughs> I thought that was really creative. Why can't we be training USDA inspectors in Mendocino County and have trainees, local residents, that can, with an internet connection, call in to wherever the head inspector, you know, the higher paid person is, and have, you know, have the person on the ground, which is incredibly important for safety, but have that, you know, I really think creative solutions are the way to do it. But it all has to do with scale, and I'm really open to the conversation. I don't pretend to have all the answers or any of the money to make it happen, but I'm really interested in moving that forward. Okay. Tony. Well, I support the uh, mobile uh, aspect, and with the USA uh, DA inspector, it always depends upon the person. I love traveling around this county and seeing all the diversity and when I was asked this question up in Laytonville, uh, I mentioned that, and, and John and Holly mentioned putting a, a slaughterhouse north uh, of Willits here at the old mill site. Uh, so I put a, quite a bit of a little research into it. And what I don't see in, in looking at the $18 million fixed cost of uh, putting in a slaughterhouse in Mendocino County is all the issues around water and sewage. And the fact that you uh, they just don't even mention it. They don't talk about how much water they're going to need. Uh, the fact that it's got to go through a sewage process and would take up capacity in our local sewer plants where they have to put in their own packet sewer plant uh, on site. Uh, the fact that only about 22% of the production of the needed uh, cattle and, and sheep uh, can be produced on a, uh, the right timing basis. Uh, for such a facility. When you build, again, a fixed facility, you always get into how do you feed it? How do you, you know, month to month, get the right numbers in so the jobs are there on a continuing basis, and they're very hard to economically support. So, again, it's, it's a mobilized and regionalized. Uh, most uh, uh, ranchers, uh, I think, are fine with the fact that you can drive a uh, slaughter right up to their uh, place. 
Sometimes you might need uh, uh, to bring that uh, uh, outhouse with you, but those are mobile too. Uh, there, there are standards, but that to me is just someone's opportunity to go into business. And, and we do need to look at the ways to do this and, and accommodate the regulations and still accommodate the need. Uh, but it's got to be to the right scale. And I think scaling these things are so important. And, you know, again, uh, new technologies are being de developed all the time. And how to uh, get things mobile, I think that's, this is a need around the country. It's not just here in Mendocino County. So if someone's going to get it right, we should be able to mobilize it. And I think that's uh, an opportunity for someone to go into business. Thank you. John? Well, technology hasn't changed forever of how you slaughter a, a beef, a lamb, or a pig. That just hasn't changed. Uh, your question was specific to a mobile operation. Uh, a station or mobile. Station. Okay. Yeah. First of all, we're going to have here within the next 30 days a presentation of the Board of Supervisors on a recent study that was done on a valley slaughterhouse facility. I'd encourage any of you to come down. Uh, you get into uh, stationary or mobile, you get into the, what do you do with the, the sewage and the water, and it takes a massive amount of water at a, at a larger scale. It all depends on the scale. Most of your slaughterhouses have moved to, out of California because of the Clean Water Act. They won't allow, I mean, they just don't, you can't do it under the California Clean Water Act. So, and the facilities have got to, a small slaughterhouse now that's built probably has a capacity to slaughter between five and 7,000 animals a day. That's, that's the reality of it. We still have a, a lamb slaughterhouse over in Dixon, California, and they were up, they used to slaughter about 3,500 to 5,000 lambs a day. Now they're down to 1,800. And the way it's looking like, it won't last only a few more years. We, we are not in an area that has enough livestock uh, to support much of a facility. Uh, and we don't have the, the corn and the, the grains raised here to, to have a feedlot alongside. But we do, we are strategically located between the Humboldt auction yard the uh, Petaloom Auction Yard, the Gold Auction Yard, the uh, Orland Auction Yard, and the, and the uh, Shasta Livestock Auction Yard, which is, if you send a buyer to each one of those facilities and they all have a sales on it for different days, you could come up with enough slaughter cattle to probably to bring here because you have the central location to slaughter. And that would supplement enough to take care of your, what the local slaughtering of, of local beef and whatnot. But there you go again into, you know, it's all right to go out, and I've done a lot of it when I was a kid. I've done a whole lot of, of what I, we call custom slaughtering. And that was basically where you go out and you slaughter a beef for a person, and you take it to your meat market and cut it up, and you give it back to them and they meat. But if you get into the issue, like I said before, of selling it on a larger scale, then you get into the whole, you got to have a federal multi-million dollar uh, facility. I think I know a little bit about this. And uh, when I first had my first business, a meat market in 19, when I was 17 years old, I uh, took a two-year correspondence course, and at that time, when I graduated from that, it was from the National Institute of Meatpacking in Chicago, Illinois. At that time, I had the education requirements to be a federal meat inspector. I don't know if that's still in place, but maybe I have. May have maybe I am the only qualified federal meat inspector in this county. I don't know. Maybe we I can know. hire you. I, yeah, maybe you can hang out with <laughs> But it's. Uh, you know, when you get into the regulatory process and building a big facility, it's a multi-million dollar facility. And when you, you know, it's kind of like a sawmill. You can't build a sawmill or a winery if you don't have no product to feed it. And it's, an, it's no different with a slaughterhouse. You got to have the product to, to feed it to make it function at a profit. And it's, uh, it's a laudable effort. There is a, a portable facility down in Central California and one of the rain. You got two real problems of, okay, you bring it into Mendocino County, where do you put it? Well, you're going to have to put it someplace where there's a certified scale because you are selling livestock over it and it has to be done with a certified scale and yet you're dealing with live animals. So you got to have corral facilities, watering facilities and all that. And what do you do with the sewage afterwards and how do you get the large amount of water? Uh, we've been in a situation the last three or four years, whether it's here in this valley or Redwood Valley or any place, nobody would want to give up their extra water, uh, water allotment to have somebody slaughter, say, say 30 head animals. So you get into those problems. but. Uh, we are in a centrally located area for a central uh, facility, and I think it, it needs to be looked at, but there you go, you get into the same issues in this county, and historically we've turned just about them all down. You get into truck traffic and water issues, and that's been the killer, whether you talk about biomass, a slaughterhouse, or much anything in this county, people just don't seem to, uh, and this is a comment that Holly said about you know, they don't want to be next to a killing zone in this county or stuff like that. Yeah. You get all those issues. And if you remember when they first taught, went into this study here about two years ago, 
there was an organized letter campaign in the newspapers to say we don't want it. So it's going to be an uphill battle. But uh, you know, that's along with localization. But you know, how how do you define the lo How do you find the word local? You know, we so have I a okay, we have a local stop. facility down in, in uh, Petaluma <laughs> called Rancho Meats, but uh, the animal rights people has burned it down twice. So. Thank I'm wondering you. if I can have a brief follow-up comment yes. that I didn't take before. You may. I disagree that there hasn't been changes in slaughtering animals. I know the basics are the same, but there's been huge strides in uh, the ability to recycle water. And there's also multiple other businesses that could be spun off, like if it was an organic facility, you could have organic uh, dog food, uh, using, using the other products for other things. And I, I think it is a big topic. We could probably have, a, honestly, a candidate's night just on this, and I'm sure many people would come and protest, but I just want to disagree in the sense that I think that we have come a long way as far as the technologies. Okay, thank you. Tony, you have the privilege of a comment if you wish. Well, I agree that uh, technology changes uh, to the demand, and, and as these problems occur, that that's what we got to look at is, is coming up with solutions for our communities. Okay. And uh, let's hope we all invest in them. All right, now this is a question that um, I'm a little, has, I, think, I think I'm going to switch. I think I'm going I'm to I'm ad lib a question here. I'm curious, um, yeah. the, uh, the Department of Labor um, has uh, recently um, uh, taken to task, um, actually uh, threatened to fine extensively um, farms on which there are apprentices um, exchanging labor for learning, basically. Um, what action would you take, what position would you take as a supervisor um, in defense of local farms who have intern or apprentice workers? Tony. Well, again, I, I came from a town where that's a critical aspect of the learning process, where you bring children in and, and you have summer camps and uh, I would go directly to my legislators and I'd put a squash on uh, that regulatory uh, uh, issue. I think it's something that would sell in the political realm. Uh, that is a, when you hear a regulation coming down of that nature, that's one you can squash really quickly just from people power. And that's exactly what we'd have to do. And uh, it usually goes pretty quick once you focus on it. Uh, but that's, uh, give me a call. I'd, I'd like to. Uh, get some letters to some legislators right away on it. I, I think we need to. I think it's a big mistake. Uh, it destroys the whole, I, we're going back into our heritage, you know, the way people learn. Uh, technical learning is so critical to passing on knowledge from generation to generation. And I'm just, that gets me pretty wild. John. Well. Whether you call it apprenticeship or helping out or anything, under current tax code, when you employ somebody, you're obligated to pay the federal and state withholding taxes. And uh, of course, also in California, you're, you're by law, you're supposed to pay uh, the, work, the workman's compensation, have that on, on and you're also uh, required to hold out the Social Security benefits. So uh, I don't know how the, the present tax code. This is really a question for a uh, United States senator or a congressperson to do that. But uh, the reason that's never been changed because you basically have that would tip upside down your whole uh, tax code. How how many thousand page tax code we have? Because everybody would say, well, I'm not uh, I'm not really hiring that guy. I'm just he's just uh, helping me out or he's just my apprentice, you know. So and that's why the law is real clear that if you employ somebody, you're obligated to pay the, to pay those those taxes. Otherwise, everybody say, well, them 5,000 people working for me, they're just my apprentices. They're not really working for me, and so we get around with taxes. So it'd be a major, major change of our existing tax code. And I don't think <coughs> a county supervisor, I'm not going to sit here and say that I have the power to uh, change that. Holly? Well, I am not familiar with, uh, with the proposal that you're discussing. It is extremely concerning and so I'd like to find out a bit more about it uh, to speak at length on that. I can speak to the benefits of, of interning and internships. Uh, there's a, a pretty incredible organization in Burlington, Vermont uh, called Intervale where they bring in 
young people and give them a plot, you know, five acres of land on a large parcel that was actually, it used to be sort of the ignored uh, industrial parcel that no one ever looked at and these people took it on. And you get, if you join the program, you can apprentice there and have shared use of their tractor and uh, other facilities and you get the camaraderie of the group. But they're basically, they're growing farmers. It's a farm incubator. And if at the end of five years, I think it is, that you get a chance to do that, you get a chance to develop your markets. And if you decide at that point that you don't want to be a farmer, because as everyone in here knows, being a farmer is not easy. And if you discover that maybe that's not your calling, it's an incredible benefit both to the, to the apprentice and you know, to the community that they know that maybe they don't want <laughs> to go that route if, if necessary. Uh, I know in our, particularly in our county, we have uh, an incredible amount of uh, people who volunteer and apprentice, and that includes woofers, willing, uh, mm -hmm. willing workers on organic farms. I, I, I see someone here in the audience who has those kind of uh, volunteers and apprentices, and I, I think it's incredibly important. So it would, be, it would be vital to at least be a strong advocate at the supervisorial level in favor of that. Okay, thank you. Just one, yeah. Uh, the Holly mentioned Vermont and California. You know, all that works good until somebody gets hurt on the job, and then you're in big trouble in California because your by law you're supposed to be covered under workman's compensation policy. So I guess if nobody gets hurt or something, you might get by with it for a while. But if you ever get an injury, you're in big trouble. All right. Briefly, lastly, John, you'll be first up again. Um, would you favor amending the Williamson Act? to make smaller uh, farms and ranches eligible? There, Currently it's 120, right? No, you, we, can, uh, we can go down to the state regulations and we allow that. We can go down to an add-on of 40 acres. To, uh, that's in, in class two. Class one, it's down to 40 acres. You can go, if you have 40 acres, say of like Valley Land or something here, you can get it in the Williamson Act beyond 40 acres. but. If, if you're class two, type two, what they call it, which is like rural land, the minimum is 160 acres. But we'll allow, like if you have a neighbor that's got 40 acres or you bought the neighbor in 40 acres, you can bring it into that. Mm -hmm. So we, re we really have the authority at the county level to do that. What we are right now, we have a year moratorium, which is about six months has passed now because we had six, about 600 uh, contracts and so it was such a large degree of them that they'd never been reviewed since I was on the board of supervisors before. I called for a review then. And in the time that I wasn't there, nobody reviewed any of them. So it got out of hand again. Mm -hmm. So we, we're not accepting any more new applications until we basically get the ones in place where they should be. And then we'll accept new ones. But we have the, we, uh, by law, we can, uh, we, we can allow the, the add-ons to that. But it's basically 40 acres of type one, which is uh, like farmland, valley land, and okay. 160 acres of type two. Thank you. But we can allow like down to a lowest 40 acres on an add-on. Well, I think it might be important. I think most for people who don't know what the Williamson Act is, uh, for those of us who are talking it up here, if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, it's an act that allows a uh, reduction in your taxes if you are utilizing your property for an agricultural purpose. And so the current governor has not been supportive at all and so has cut the county's funding. Basically the county gives, gives you a break on your taxes and the state formerly used to backfill that money. And the state has cut that off uh, currently. So uh, what John was talking about, about the county is floating that basically without being backfilled currently. And the reason why this is so important, why the act is so important, is because it really it gives a benefit for people who are, uh, you know, perform working in agriculture. There is some people who have a hard time getting by without that benefit, and so we really need to advocate for it uh, at the state level. is incredibly important, but we also need to, if. Preserving agriculture in our area is important to us. We need to make sure that that is, is well known and known at the county level as far as make, being able to make those payments. And I think scrutiny of, of what is existing is absolutely important. Uh, I know it was sort of a wink and a nod like, oh, I'm in agriculture. Uh, you know, I, I could get that benefit. And 
you know, I've got a few trees out there with no, no intention of actually uh, getting any income off your property. So that scrutinization that's going on, going over the contracts is important, but it's also involves a lot of, I think, communication is required because some, you know, little old ladies that have a ranch that they've been working on forever may not be up on what's going on. And when they get these calls saying, you know, they, they're going to be bumped off of the off of the rolls. I think it's really important to make sure that everyone knows what's going on so that they can act, you know, and make their voices heard accordingly. Thank you. Tony. Uh, it's hard to get that kind of change when you're in a budget acts uh, mode at the state level. And so you really have to time when you, you make a move for, uh, say, an improvement because you've got a lot of groups localizing, you've got a lot of five-acre uh, parcels, and there's not a lot of five-acre parcels, by the way. I mean, it's, it's not as available. Uh, but if you get down to that scale, you'd, you'd have to advocate it through the granges. I mean, that's what granges are for. You know, if you have time changes in conditions, if you have people changing the way they farm, uh, it's going to be the kind of, uh, again, most coalitions, it takes a coalition to, to get something that large change that has an economic impact. You'd have to show that these local small farms are producing revenues and jobs to offset the fact that you're no longer going to, you're going to give a break in the property tax because uh, counties really depend on those county uh, property taxes. So do the schools. I mean, there's a lot of, th that pie gets divided a lot of ways. And so uh, you got to show that there's a benefit to, to give a, a break. And right now, the state's pulling the, you know, just like the county pulled it on fire districts. Uh, when I first got here, they used to augment uh, for Prop 13 our fire districts, and that money's gone. So you, you have to realize as things get tighter, those kind of revenues available to offset and produce for a tax break uh, goes away. And it's much harder to establish them. You've got to have a vibrant economy. And that's why I have all these energy uh, localizing energy production because it's money we already spend. It goes back into the local economy, generates sales taxes as we begin to do that process, have a vibrant economy. Then we can look at things like this. Thank you. A little, can I add on just, you know, the Williamson Act has been probably the biggest cons conservation uh, uh, deal that's ever been done in California. But the other side of the story is, too, because the, in the property tax, 60% of the property tax goes to the schools. So when you're giving people a tax break, like farmers on a break on their taxes, it's really actually, it hurts the funding of, of the schools. So I think that's why the, that's why the governor... Uh, number one, he mm. can save a lot of money by not giving out the county subvention, but somebody in the school side is, hey, you know what, if you just kind of slow up this Williamson Act, it's actually going to help the school funding. So there's, you know, in government you learn there's always two sides to every story. Thank you. Okay. There, okay. Sorry, there is, there is two <laughs> sides, but the amount of money that the state is, sent, is saving by not funding the Williamson Act is a pittance compared to other things, and if we don't have food to eat, if, if 101 goes out, uh, be it a big storm or whatever, we have very little current food supply in this valley or in Round Valley, which is equally as uh, strategically could get very much cut off. And Laytonville, I, if we don't put our money and our political voice where our food is, I think we're going to have a hard road ahead. Thank you. All right. So, I'd like to propose two ground rules. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for responding to these questions. Um, I want to ask, first of all, that you stand up, that you speak clearly so the microphone can hear your question. If you don't want it recorded, please say so. Secondly, please keep your question brief. And don't make speeches. You got that? You want to be first? Would you stand, please? Um, this is about local food production and agriculture. Um, so uh, it may sound like this question is not directly relevant, but it is for the following reason. We're faced with a project uh, in our valley that will irrevocably destroy more than 100 acres of uh, prime ag land. And uh, this may sound trivial, only 100 acres, but given the fact that in Mendocino County, 
we have uh, a relatively small um, number of prime ag land acres available at all. So destroying any of it, I think, is uh, a, a real detriment to our future, possibly. So uh, very, very probably, yes. And so the question is, and this, this project that will destroy this land is called the Willits Bypass Project. So the question is, um, yes, no, do you support the bypass or not? Uh, I forget who started. I think John did. So Holly, would you go first? <laughs> yes, no, I'd have to say no right now. Um, uh, right now, uh, it's not it's not an easy question, especially in this community where it's the third the third rail of Wilts politics. And I know my mom completely supports the bypass, and the <laughs> you know my neighbor across the street is completely against it. So the main reason has immediately in my mind is not the impact on the ag land, which is true, but there's so much ag land that's not being utilized in our valley right now, not just where the, where the bypass would be. So I think that that's important to look at. What concerns me is that it really may not help the city of Willits that much. The costs have spiraled out of control to 200 and, I think it was 286 million last time I checked. And <laughs> there's just many issues. and. Finally, I think it might be extremely de detrimental to the city of Willits, and I don't know if we can afford the part of the road that will be uh, relinquished to us if and when it happens. I know that it will create jobs. I know that it will move some trucks past some trucks past our area, but I also don't know if it really makes sense, and I'm concerned about the amount of money that's going into it. All right, Tony. Uh, for Burke Trails, uh, I'd have to say yes, I support the bypass. I've worked on the project for 17 years. I was trained by the Union of Concerned Scientists in the early 80s to be a transportation advocate, uh, to get involved, to actually, uh, by getting involved, uh, this project is very different than what Caltrans started with and would have ended up with. So you have to bring in your local concerns. And I'll tell you, regionally, you go north, uh, there's some people who might be against the bypass, but they're not that many. Um, I'll be working to uh, bring the social economic impacts to the city of Willits uh, to a tolerable level. I'm, I'm looking for the uh, people with canes like myself down the line and, and their electric little uh, carts. and. and you know, my daughter lives in Santa Cruz, and I see a very vibrant downtown. I see uh, mixed uses going on. When I had my storefront on 101 and watched the, the lumber trucks come in and stop at every light and shake all that, that uh, fine dust off their trucks, uh, we're not seeing that right now. But, you know, timber country, it's a cycle. You know, I worked against the cut and run policies, but, you know, and eventually with sustainability, we'll see timber trucks coming through our community again. I want them on the bypass. I've also advocated for electric uh, vehicles, as you know. I think we're going to change the technology that we're going to put on these roadbeds. They're going to be a lot quieter, cleaner, uh, more efficient, and the American way, unfortunately, uh, is still the individual vehicle. I mean, that's the way we've, we've really set up our communities. I support rail. I think uh, I traveled, I didn't even have a license, so I was 21 and I moved to California. I had to get a car. Uh, but I used bikes, I used, uh, I could walk to the, an MTA uh, uh, stop and go into the city of Boston and get on a bud liner and go out to the north coast, uh, you know, and travel 200 miles in half a day. Thank you. John? Yes, I support the Willis Bypass. I think everybody has a little frustration of the route, but keep in mind, in order to get through all this federal and state the mitigation, all those issues, the route is what basically was dissipated, supplied or put forward because of getting around the uh, heritage oaks and the wetlands and all those issues. But everybody has a lot of frustration. Early on, I felt that the bypass should have went right directly along the east side of the railroad tracks all the way through the valley. It would have hardly impacted the valley. But Holly, I, I'm really surprised to hear you say now because I've been to I don't know how many meetings uh, it, with the city council, and actually I sit on a committee for the relinqu relinquish agreement to move forward uh, between the city and Caltrans. And for you to sit here tonight and say you don't support the bypass, it's a, it's a total flip-flop in your position, and it's, uh, 
I, I, uh, I, it really surprises me. Can I respond briefly? I, briefly, please. I'd have to disagree uh, as far as a flip-flop. I've really, since I've been sitting on the Willett City Council, I've never been a strong advocate for the council, and I've always had my concerns, and I think rightly so. And I think that because of the complexity of those issues, I mean, it's, it's going to, it's on task to move forward, and it's going to create a lot of jobs in the short term in theory, but I just don't know if we're ever going to get there. I mean, you know, I, I grew up here, and I'm sort of now, I've become more in the I'll, I'll believe it when I see it camp, because, mm -hmm. just because it's been, I mean, it's been my entire life that, I mean, I'm 32, and it's been my entire life that we've been talking about this bypass. I think we can do common sense traffic mitigation in our community that relieves traffic congestion, but also allows for people and, and, and allowing us to remain vibrant. Um, Tony, you want to say on this? Yeah, a quick retort. Uh, you know, we studied the in-city, uh, you know, putting other roads in over on the uh, more easterly side, and the community was not in support. It was like, why are you moving the road to my neighborhood? Okay, it, it's trying to move the traffic around and have different uh, north-south corridors hasn't worked up in Eureka. Uh, Brook Trails loads for. 10,000 cars a day into the city of Willits. 40% of it would use the bypass in a northern interchange, and you won't have that loading of traffic. Instead, people who want to come into Willits, and this is what I hear in the North County, you want them to come shop in Willits, well, then you want to give them a bypass. If they feel you're against the bypass, I've heard, I haven't heard pretty things about what they feel about Willits. Okay. And trapping those people is, they're not happy with it. All right. I just want to say a word before the next question. The, the theme of this forum is food and farming. However, I realize that there is apparently not another forum planned for the candidates uh, in the district. So of course, you will ask the questions you choose to ask. But I want to encourage those related to food and farming, um, if possible. I think you had your hand up next, and then I'll get you. Speak up, please. Bill Brunel, I live here, and I do not have a If you are the supervisor, could you see seeing two things that you, that you could concretely and specifically, there's been a lot of talk, specifically do in your first year that would help localization of food and self sufficiency Two things in your first year that would help localization of food and self-sufficiency. Tony, I think you're up next. Well, my big proposal is our energy independence and uh, forming the Mendocino Area Energy Authority for all of Mendocino County and investing in each other uh, to capture our energy dollars. And when the food expert came in uh, to the city council uh, chambers earlier this week, I asked specifically about uh, if we took care of our water issues and our energy issues, what would that do to our ability to compete in production of food? And he says, you'd be way ahead of the game. Uh, you have to look at, it's like that you talk about four-legged and three-legged stools. And, and basically, you have to look at, at what you can do to stabilize your local economy so all these other things that we want to do, food production is a classic example, uh, is much more supportable and competitive. So I'm going to, I've already, I came with one, within one person and one vote in the city of Willits to form this uh, area energy authority. I know how to form it where if a city wants to opt out, I'll do it that way next time. So that we'll, we'll gather in the partners that are ready to go and there's much of this county ready to uh, jump on the bandwagon of starting towards energy independence with renewable energy, clean energy, uh, People are ready to do it. And the other thing, of course, is uh, if I'm a supervisor, then I'm going to help direct uh, uh, resources into community gardens. Uh, I donated a, uh, a Troy-built uh, rototiller to the local effort, and I believe they've already about doubled the size of uh, what they're doing this year in the community. So uh, it's simple things that we can do to uh, upgrade the amount of food production within the valley. and. Uh, Sometimes it's on a personal level, and uh, you just got to get down and do it. I, I started life weeding gardens for 
five dollars an hour. It was a lot of money back then, and it's my first paying job. Uh, and I, I look forward to having our kids learning that you know good hard work uh, pays off. John, two things in your first year. Uh, thank you for that question. Actually, that's the real reason why I want to run another term is because I got some projects going on that really needs to follow up. One is water projects, uh, the preservation of the water and eel, but also in specific, uh, when you talk about real agriculture, we need better water supply. And that's why I'm working on the Scout Lake project in conjunction with the Boy Scouts of America to bring some of that water uh, for use in the Villas Valley. It's not, a, that water available won't be about growth, it'll be just about sustainability. And the other, and always going on, is infrastructure. You know, roads, better roads helps products move back and forth to market so on a lot better basis. And it's always a part to try to fight off the local regulatory process too. And I can go on and on the things that I've done about the general plan and uh, protecting uh, ag land through that process. You know, you do have uh, pressures at different times where people want to come and get a land use change from agricultural land. So, uh, but this, those are just some of the things that are kind of ongoing that I've, uh, the water project, the Scout Lake project that I, I'm moving forward with. And I just feel that I want to be here in place to, to move these issues forward. But there's uh, several of those land use decisions come up from time to time are always ongoing. And I will say though, you know, when you talk about a slaughterhouse or a uh, commercial commission, uh, kitchen, it, it, a lot of these issues comes down to uh, a land use decision. For instance, if you want to put a, a commercial kitchen in a, a residential zoning or something that may take a zone change and things like that. I, I always lean toward the, the property right side of things. Uh, if you're not hurting your, your neighbor, then, then allow you to do it. Uh, the slaughterhouse facility may, may come before, whether it's a, a portable facility or a, a large facility may become up and I, I, I got to say even though it would be a land use decision that comes before the board and we have to act kind of like a judge and not have the biased opinion on anything before it comes to us but I lead I uh, lean toward the private property right side where I would look certainly favorable of doing something like that and decisions like that I guarantee you sitting here right now if a slaughterhouse house facility ever come to be cited whether it's a small one or a big one here in the third district it's going to be the one, the one of the biggest controversial decisions <laughs> ever, ever been. Same with the, same was was with the biomass plant that Harwood tried. Same with the sawmill. Those are extreme high, high uh, uh, issues that really push people's buttons in those these, those land use decisions. But uh, Thank I, you. I made the tough decisions in the past, and I'll continue to do so. Holly, your two things. I think two specific things I would work on the next year, Bill, thank you for that, is uh, in addition to the Scout Lake project, which I do think is valuable, I think personal water accessibility and conservation is something where I could uh, get some action. Coming up with uh, some set plans for water catchment systems, uh, conservation systems uh, that can be permitted but are basically rubber stamped that if you put this at your house you'll have increased water for irrigation because uh, as we know we get all of our water in the winter uh, increased water for irrigation increase uh, water for emergency uh, access but the other specific thing that I think I would do in this next year as supervisor is leading by example I think that I'm already walking the talk as far as shopping at our local farmers market, uh, participating in the CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Movement. Uh, I'm already working towards doing these programs and I'm involved in a lot of the groups that are doing this. Um, I'm on the board of EDFC that's looking at the, the meat processing facility. I'm on Wells Economic Localization. I'm already sort of privy to a lot of what everyone else is doing. So I think one of the roles at the supervisorial level is to represent those values on the board. And I, I differ from my opponent in the sense that although I appreciate the ability to use one's property as they want, there are differences. Uh, Measure A is an example of that. That property owner wanted to change the zoning in from what it was from industrial in, to retail. And I, I think there's a difference when it's a massive out-of-town corporation wanting to use their property as they want. I don't think it behooves us to allow uh, property owners to uh, pillage our resources is, is what I felt was going on there. 
So I think leading by example is, and my judgment is, is really what you would be voting for if you supported me. Okay. Briefly, very briefly. Briefly, uh, Holly was actually wrong on that. The proposal on that Masonite, former Masonite site, was not to change it from uh, industrial to commercial. It was a proposal was to change it from, from industrial to mixed use, which is a huge difference in commercial. Okay, thank you. All right. Your Wait, question, uh, please. Uh, no, Tony didn't get the answer. Oh, 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 you didn't get the answer. Oh, I did. I started it. I started it. Tony started, started it. Yeah. Uh, you started. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Statement. Did you do Very that? brief oh, statement. Then a question, please. I didn't take advantage. Since uh, King Kong had taught a very dear to my heart, <laughs> I didn't want to talk about food, so I had to leave out the King Kong. So I'm wondering if uh, any of you supervisors, <laughs> what is your position? on uh, promoting hemp agriculture in the county, not just medicinal marijuana, but growing hemp for seed, for food. We can do it. It's, a, it's an excellent food source, and it's something we can grow in the county. And also growing hemp for other purposes, like making ping pong tables, ping pong paddles, ping pong balls, all be made out of hemp. We could be, you know, the industry leader right here in Mendocino County. Thank you, sir. John? Could I start with a question? Are you any good at ping pong? You should play. You should play. No, you know, uh, hemp production, we've heard a lot about that in the last few years. But about the only thing I'm going to say about it, I'll be really brief, hemp takes a lot of water. It's, it's a water plant. And if, if you're for hemp production on a larger scale, on a commercial scale, then you're going to have to be for massive amounts of water. And I mean massive you amounts of water. I do support hemp production, and I produce putting marijuana in with agriculture so that, for a number of for a number of reasons, so that there is, uh, so that it takes the legal aspects out of that. If if you want to grow hemp in your yard, you could do so but also because I'm interested in gathering data. We have almost no concrete numbers or data about the amount of marijuana that's grown in, in our county. And when, when we look at this ag census data that lets us know how much money is leaving our community uh, because of our food dollars, we can't take that into account. We can't take that information into account to make smart decisions. And I, and I would like to put it in with agriculture uh, although I do think that hemp production most likely will be happening in the Central Valley if it is if it is legalized. Tony? I agree with that last uh, bit, but my family uh, uh, has been growing hemp for hundreds of years in America. Uh, first in Jamestown, my uh, family controlled the Manila hemp uh, market for three generations. Those are those nice white sails that the clipper sh uh, ships had and the wagon trains used uh, for their harnesses. So. Uh, hemp has been part of, uh, well, I think about half or a third of our founding fathers grew hemp. Um, so it's, it's with cotton and tobacco, it's what created our agric commercial agricultural industries in America and actually is what we traded back to uh, Europe uh, was hemp, uh, tobacco, and cotton. And uh, we eventually learned to do added value products. Uh, my uh, family uh, founded Burlington Industries, and we actually provided the uniforms for World War II as hemp. Uh, Did they but, sell any butt? Uh, no, and, but you do get to the uh, medical aspect of cannabinoids, and, and one thing I learned in that all-day seminar the other day is that there are people who need to juice a, a lower quality plant every day for their medicine. Or they can eat it, yes. It's agricultural. So the, there's, there's all these other things that aren't uh, uh, to get you high, but you know, are actually going to be produced you know, naturally to uh, produce different medical uh, attributes. And so there, there's, again, you look at added value. Now I'm told that most of that will be in greenhouses to have the certification uh, uh, organic certification and medicinal uh, certification. Uh, it's going to be under very controlled environments to uh, make sure that it's healthy and, and with certified organic, you know, certification programs are very important to product reliability. Um, it's certainly going to be a part of our county that for generations to come. So, to the Grange Kitchen, they freeze dried. The uh, next question, please. 
Hi, my name is Steve Brown. Um, I guess we've kind of come full circle here with the hemp stuff. Um, we can't compete with the hemp. Who says we can compete with apples and oranges and anything else? So the sustainability equation here, regionomics, a dollar traveling around the county and not going somewhere else. Does anybody really try to put together how many people can be sustained on our schizophrenic landscape? I mean, we, it was snowing yesterday, you know? And two, for four years before that, it didn't rain in, in April. So what is your question? How, many, how much farming can support how many people in pretty marginal farmland on my how much land can support how many people? Are you prepared to respond to well, that yeah. question? Is it my turn? Uh, I think it is. Well, I don't, I don't well, go ahead. Holly said a little <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Holly said a little earlier that, like the valleys of Cobo and whatnot, how we're very limited on our food supply. Actually, we have more food in in these valleys or around these valleys. It may not be the type of food that people want to eat, but when you talk about just just the cattle business industry around here, in Mendocino County, uh, for for instance, I could, in a two-day time, without a gallon of gas, I could drive about three, 400,000 pounds of beef into this valley, which would feed. And Kovalo, the people over there, could do the same. So in a way, we do have a lot of food stored around these valleys. You know, and it could be, there isn't probably, uh, when I was a kid, my dad was the, uh, the, the county trapper. Between Longvale and the county line, just in that area, there was 25,000 sheep. Now I think there's maybe a couple hundred. That just tells you how our capacity, the land is still there, the grass is still there to grow, it's just, it's, it's very underutilized. So, you know, we talk about being sustainable, but we're really not utilizing to the capacity that we could. And if you look at what we produce now, yes, I guess you say, well, we probably don't have a net uh, volume of food to, to export because we, we're, we're consuming more than we grow. And that's probably, I don't know if you could figure out the numbers, but that's probably a, a, a fair statement. But if we got this country just in grazing land, I'm not talking about high and in, intense truck farming or, or grain or any of that, but just we, if we got our grazing capacity back up what it was uh, when I was a kid, uh, it would be tremendous. And that, that has a side effect of your economy too. For instance, in Covalo, just in the National Forest, uh, up until the 70s, there was 27 people, ranchers that graze their sheep and cattle in the national forest. Now I think there's two. So that's just in one block of land. It just shows you how we've diminished. And as far as wood production, we're, we're not harvesting anything out of it. Now the national forest, the whole eastern side of Mendocino County, from, from Lake Port, or from Lake County, clear to uh, uh, up, up north. It's the whole eastern side, and we're not producing nothing. You know, so we are certainly Underproducing our capacity that we have. Okay, and, thank and you. I'm going to keep us moving. Holly, I apologize. I think That's you should have been first this time. I'm sorry. Go That's ahead. okay. I'm not. I don't mind who goes first. Um, there has been studies done on that. Uh, Wilt's economic localization, when it first got started, uh, did a full inventory, I believe. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but there's been numerous people who have looked at that as far as our population and what it really would take. I think there's some differences in opinion. Uh, as far as what is arable land that you could be growing on. I think some people feel like it, you know, it needs to be out in the valley, bigger, bigger tracks, which there is a relatively limited amount of that, especially since this used to be the Little Lake Valley and it's underwater half the time, uh, at least uh, to our northern boundary. But I can, I can get that information to you if you leave your phone number on, on my desk back there. Uh, so I think it, we certainly aren't producing near what we consume, but the, the population, I think, of Mendocino County, you know, we, we do consume quite a bit, despite the fact that we're a rural community, and we do not have much in the way of emergency preparedness. Uh, there are some shipping containers around, but as I mentioned, if the road gets cut off, uh, we do have a certain amount of storage on the hoof, as John, as John said, but I think I heard that um, uh, during the last depression, it took three months to clear these hillsides of wild deer. You know, right now, we can't keep the deer out of our yards, or the wild turkeys. I've noticed a massive increase in the wild turkeys. But if there really is a crisis and a food crisis, uh, that gets diminished extraordinarily rapidly. So that's why we're trying to build this capacity and also trying to use this uh, local food movement as an economic development tool. 
Okay, thank you. Tony. Uh, I believe we've actually lost some of our population of late, but uh, I'm amazed that the uh, idea of fishery and the fishery being so declined uh, has been completely left out of this discussion. It used to take the Native Americans through the winter. Um, it's something that when I first got here, I, I tried to get local forest rules uh, put in place, uh, and it was a coalition of forest workers and, and fishermen. Uh, it used to be a $3 billion industry on the North Coast. Uh, we got to bring those fish back. Uh, it's taking 20 years, but the uh, water project in Brook Trails is mimicking nature. We're actually uh, gauging our water flows, and if you look at our graphs, we're just following right the way. Within 24 hours, we're flowing that water uh, just as nature is producing it, and that's very important. Uh, I, I w can't wait for the city of Willits to catch up to Brook Trails so that we, we get those early uh, rains down the stream when the uh, salmon are trying to come up and spawn. Uh, greenhouses, a lot of things. When I on my property back east, when we found the Ecology Action Center, the way we proved that organic, uh, the, the 20 acres our town bought was an old potato field, and they felt they had to use chemicals to bring it into production. Well, we took three quarters of an acre and produced the same amount of food intensively, organically, and proved that organic had the ability to outstrip uh, chemical farming. And that's how we, we convinced our town to go into organic farming in the first place. So it's all uh, greenhouses, organic farming. We can produce a lot more. Uh, and we have a lot of talented growers out there now that if marijuana gets legalized, they might be looking for other added value products as well to augment their uh, incomes and cold storage. Uh, we need some cold storage. Uh, solar powered so that it's uh, cost effective but that way uh, the crops you do grow will last longer and be available for uh, local uh, food. I, I do keep two weeks supply of uh, military rations uh, in storage and I recommend everyone do that um, so that you do have, uh, it's not as nice to, uh, I hope never to eat them. And they're a five year storage so they say, well eventually you're gonna have to eat them. But uh, it's very important that we each take responsibility to store within our own houses or in our outbuildings uh, away from animals uh, uh, emergency supplies. Okay, thank you. Now, we promised we would try to wrap up by about 8.30. Um, are, you, are you game for one more question if someone has one? Sure. Yeah? yeah. Does someone have <laughs> one? Does someone have one? You ready to pose a question? I have a question. Well, oh, I think somebody beat you. Somebody beat you. Sorry. Oh, you want to arm I defer or? to Ron. All right. Go for it, Ron. All right. Keep it brief, please. Brief, please. All right. We have so. a love fest over here. All three of you look different. It don't sound that much. I even did a point thing to see what the difference is. I've been here in this town for a little over 10 years. Seems sometimes a long time. Seems like issues. John, you've been on the board now for a while now, and you seem to like to dance around. Come on with the question. The Don't. question. The question is, the number one income for this area here statistically is sales tax revenue. It's coming from your fast foods. It's coming from your gas station stops. And, and that's where you're is. making your money. So uh, what is that about government? OK. What's the question? What's the question? What well, you can do something with that. I mean, that's where your money's really coming from. All the other things you're talking about, that's not where your money's coming from. It's really coming from your sales tax revenue, McDonald's, and all those fast foods, so and your gas station stocks, that you let them sell cigarettes, tobacco, and gas at the same time. So station. what is your question about the sales tax revenue? Well, that's where your money's coming, and alcohol from your gas station stocks. Well, I'll that's, try what, to, I'll get, try that's to what government has been doing. So what do you think? What are you going to do? I mean, right now, it's on the Titanic. I'll try, I'll try to answer oh. what, I, what I think the question is. It's sort of like Jeopardy. What is, how will, how will I as supervisor uh, affect sales tax when, you know, sales are going through the floor? All right. Can you do that in And how minute? I will. Yes. Can you respond to that in I can. All right. I have been a big part of the of the localization movement. We've been talking about that as food, but I'm, I'm a big supporter of shopping locally. And I know that our sales tax is, is going down, and that's largely is because of gasoline. We need to figure out other ways to diversify our economy besides just relying on gas. 
Our sales tax here in the third district surprisingly hasn't gone down as much and I think that's because we are always living in a little bit of an economic de depression in, in our area. You know, we don't have a lot of car sales uh, in here like, like they do in, in Ukiah. So, you know, we have sort of benefited from that. I do feel like I've shown myself to be different from my incumbents and I think it's a, I think it's a good thing that we actually all get along and can work together because I think that's what's going to have to come. That's, that's how we're going to be able to make it through this crisis is coming together as a community, working together and by supporting our local business is how I'm going to, is how I'm going to grow sales tax in our, in our communities. Okay. One minute on how you grow sales tax. Well, there we go with renewable energy. It's the energy dollars we're spending now that we're going to recapture for our local economy. Uh, I, I sent 33 cents to PG&E last year with 18 solar panels. I pay $100 a month for 10 years on. They'll last 50 years. As energy price uh, inflation continues, I'm going to save more and more and more, and that money goes in my pocket to spend at those local businesses locally. That was 45 cents. <laughs> I got that one down. John. Well, I believe your, the sales tax here in, in the city will it's there have a half cent. So I believe your sales tax is eight and three quarters percent. Uh, county government and uh, county government gets one percent of the sales tax out of the eight and a quarter percent counties collect countywide because we don't have a special sales tax like Willis does. But we get one percent of that. Even. The way the way you capture more of that. You, you, do land, you vote for land use decisions that allows for that money to be spent here in Mendocino County. Uh, just that Measure H, which I know 70% of the people supported it, I voted against it. Measure but yeah, Measure A, it allowed, that allowed, this, and this, this, the economic studies show that we lost uh, just Mendocino County's portion of the sales tax, about a million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Now, when, that's significant when you're talking about trying to save the Willits Library for 40000 bucks. The loss of that. You get up to the north end of the county, we're getting a tremendous loss of our sales tax going to Humboldt County. When we live, Mendocino County's basic population is built along Highway 101 and on the coast Highway 1. It's so easy for people to go laterally north and south, and that's what they're doing. If we don't have the opportunities for sales here in this county, people are going to go to get them, and that's what they're doing. And, you know, I mean, when you talk about local, my definition of local is kind of, I guess, the boundaries of Mendocino County. Because, for instance, Willits has a, a half-cent sales tax higher in Willits, and when the people from Willits or Covalo or Banscombe come near to Willits, they pay that half-cent sales tax extra, but they really don't get a benefit from it because it goes to the roads in Willits. Well, that's fine because I look at it, we're all in this together. We're all from Mendocino County. But we have to capture some of that huge loss. 30 years ago, the huge loss of people on a bad road driving to Santa Rosa or to Eureka wasn't a big deal. But now with the roads are a lot better shape and cars are more comfortable and gas mileage, the, the gas mileage on vehicles are so much greater, it's easier to hop in the car and go to Santa Rosa for the morning. When I was kids, we went to Santa Rosa and we had to stay at our aunt's for a week before we wanted to come back. <laughs> now people drive down there to go shopping for the morning. So we have to get those shopping opportunities. And I'm just talking about sales tax, which your question was about. We have to allow them here. Otherwise, you know, you know, basically Sonoma County's taking our water and selling it to Marin County. They got a half a billion dollars in reserves in the Sonoma County Water Agency from selling our water. And now we're just accommodating by not lighting anything here, and we're doing all our shopping down there. Well, and now we're struggling to keep okay. our library open for 40000 right, It's crazy, John, folks. I need, to ask you, I need to ask you to stop. Are we going to have a wrap-up? So time? I'm going to... Uh, really relevant. Really relevant. Now, they're talking about sales tax revenues. Willis has an ordinance that won't allow medicinal marijuana dispensaries in the city. Now, that certainly would be a source of revenue that the city could use, but uh, Thank you. how is your position on that? Uh, uh, do we want to take this up, or, or well, shall we pass it? Let's I, stay in the foreman. I, I, that was my intention, and, and with respect, we will. Okay, so if there isn't a burning question about food or farming, then I'm going to going once, going twice, going thrice. He had one here. We, oh. My question is not on food or farming. So, okay. your call. Can I ask it? Uh, <laughs> no. Is the audience willing? 
there's a mix, there's mix, there's mixed feedback. Let's see if you can do it really briefly, and let's see if they can do it really briefly. BMW Willis is not going to sponsor a debate. I think we should allow that. All right, retirement fund. It's going down. And the question: What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about the retirement? Okay, now I'm not talking about the retiree health benefits. I'm talking about the fund itself which relies on, you know, uh, basically a strong U.S. stock market to put money in. But that stock market isn't happening. So the money is not going in at the same rate that it has been. So. It's at 4.4% instead of 8%. So I'm just saying, if the fund starts to sink over a long period of time, what would you do? Where would you draw the line on that? Well, now, we, need to, we need to come up with local investment strategy. Uh, it's absolutely true. I think tying everything to the stock market is foolhardy and I, it, in, the, in the best of times. And it's the way that the pension system is set up, so that is not something I'm going to attempt to suggest that I would be able to fix in the first year. But I'd be happy to talk more about that at, after. All right, Tony, briefly, please. Uh, vote no on uh, uh, Proposition 16, where PG&E is going to try to limit our ability to bond, where we can take our retirement funds, money generated locally, invest in that whole renewable energy, energy independence process, where we're investing and building our private property values, so we're getting double the bang, triple the bang for the buck. And uh, that's the way to go. I, I think we should be taking those retirement dollars, investing them locally in renewable energy that has all those added benefits that come along with becoming energy independent locally. Thank you. One minute for you. I assume, Mike, when you said that our retirement system, is, I'm assuming you're referring to the county employees' retirement yes. system, which not, is basically not, not the Granger. Okay. <laughs> first of all, first of all, I just I disagree with that completely. That statement you made that it's going down. It's not going down. The value of it, the book value went down about 27%, and, but most of that book value actually has already come back, and I say most is over half of that. So, uh, you know, we still have 1,262 county employees that are playing into the system. That is a major part of the revenues for the retirement system. And uh, as far as excess earnings are going to retiree health benefits, uh, you were at the meeting, we basically eliminated that two weeks ago. That was a very controversial uh, step, but, but we had the guts to do it, which, it, it was a no-brainer. It had to be done. But when it gets real politically, especially for a guy like me, to take away excess earning retirement benefits for people that worked for the county 30 years ago, it wasn't a very popular thing to do. We didn't have a choice. There was no money. But the retirement system, that was outside of the excess earnings for the retirement health benefits, as far as the retirement system, is probably one of the, still, one of the best retirement systems there is, no doubt. Uh, in comparison, if you compare our, the situation of our county's retirement system with that of the state's CalPERS, Mendocino County's is 10 times greater shape than CalPERS. Okay. So if we have a problem, the, Cal, the state employees have got a 10 times worse problem. But there's going to be, in the future, you're going to see higher contribution rates and you're going to see less benefits. And, and, and then there's some variations of that, maybe a higher age limit to where they get benefits. You know, at the federal level, Social Security is facing the same thing. Our federal uh, government has yet to deal with it, but it's a major issue, and they're trying to pass along. Thank you, John. But we are dealing with it. Thank you, John. Now, I'd like to give each of you the opportunity for a very brief wrap-up comment. Who wants to start? Tony, would you like to start? Thank you for having us. Uh, you know, this is where I started in life was uh, organic food, uh, food production, open space, uh, Common lands, that's, that's what we had back east. Common lands meant the people's land. And it's so important that before your, your land prices go through the roof, which eventually if population demands it, uh, you need to really look at uh, the bypass was leveraged to create a lot of common lands. In other words, there's going to be uh, protected open space. When I see that bypass going, to me it is a Willits Wall urban infill to the west and Little Lake Valley protected to the east. It's so important or else we're wasting the fact that an interstate highway is removed out of town. There's other advantages we had to leverage out of that project so that we created ways to define urban, rural, 
and we got to protect the open spaces of Mendocino County, Brook Trails infill development, Willits infill development, but let's not subdivide out in our open spaces. Thank you. John, brief closing. Well, first of all, thank you for coming here. And it's uh, when it comes to the production of food and fiber and sustainability, it's nothing, it's certainly nothing new to me. It's been nothing new to my family for generations, and I totally support it at all levels. It's really tough. I really feel we're still on a spiral as an example. Masut, which has had a good reputation for its organic beef, uh, just went out of business last week. They loaded up all their cattle and shipped them and sold them all because it wasn't profitable. That's one of the problems we have with, with raising livestock or grains or hogs or any product you have. It's hard to make a profit. And at some point in time, no matter how much of a pot of money you start with, you need to make a profit. And that's really, you know, people ask me what's the biggest problem in the cattle business. It's always been, number one has always been the price. And then you have all these other pressures. And frankly, when you're basically, you're in the land business and the high price of the land, it's always easy to say, well, I'm going to bail out. Well, you sell and it gets split up or something and you lose your production capacity. We need to do everything we can. One thing we need to do, we need to keep the operating costs. You know, fees and higher taxes and higher, uh, you know, it's, it's really been really popular, you know, to satisfy government. Uh, I've always been opposed to new fee increases. Because it only, not only affects the people in production, it affects all the people out there. You know, we have to learn in government to operate on less. Because you, especially farmers and ranchers, have known the concept of operating on less for generations and for years. You know, and government has to get that way too. Because government can't just keep going to the trough to the taxpayers and the people out there for more money. So we're going to have to learn how to run and take care of our roads in a more efficient manner and our law enforcement and operate with the revenues we have. Because we just can't keep going to the source, to the farmers and ranchers out there on their limited incomes and keep asking them for more. Thank you. That's totally unsustainable. Okay. Holly, brief closing. Well, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm running for supervisor because I think we need some fresh leadership here and I think I can provide that. I think that this next term, sometimes I wonder what the heck the three of us are thinking because I think this next term is going to be extraordinarily hard. Uh, there are not just economic factors, but there's environmental factors that are coming into play all right now. And how we react as a community will really determine how we get through that process. Uh, and local food is at the core of that. Uh, local food is at the basis, really, of how, how we're going to uh, move forward in this process. And I think it would be, I don't think I could underestimate, understate that fact. And I think that I will represent that well, well on the Board of Supervisors. And I think that we need someone that has the vision to be able to, to be able to see that road forward and to make the hard decisions and calls that will help us get there. Thank you. And I also, just in brief, close, in brief closing, it's not too late for someone to host a candidate's night. If, if you're interested in having a candidate's night, the election is June 8th, which is rapidly approaching, but it is a month away. So if you are part of the Seroptimists or the Rotary or another group that is interested in doing it, uh, it, it can be done. <laughs> and we would love it. <laughs> we learn from each other. Thank you all very much, the three of you, for coming and for taking this seriously. Thank you all for being here. Good night.